everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Mentor Project. In case you are joining us for the first time, I'm Dr. Susan Bernstone, and I'm your host. And on today's show, I am really, truly honored to have with us Robert or Bob Cousins. And Bob is actually the co-founder of The Mentor Project and the CTO. Bob has worked with startups in both energy and computing for more than 35 years. He has served as CTO and engineering VP of multiple technology companies from New York to California. He is an inventor, a technologist. He holds over 25 patents in diverse areas, including file system design, data storage, and security high-frequency radar, imaging and medical instrumentation, and virtual credit cards. He has also written three novels, and he is also mentoring two uh, students. One is a high school student, and one is a college student for The Mentor Project. I am so honored and privileged to have you on the show today, Bob. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is just great. And, you know, as people are going to hear you talk about um, soon is is regarding the inventors and what really defines and makes someone an inventor. And I was really, I learned so much listening to your talk that everyone's going to have the opportunity. But before they see that, I wanted to talk about a little bit about you in terms, you have a very interesting background um, because oftentimes people think that, great inventors or people that are in these really interesting fields that they were influenced by family members that it was maybe you know they just followed in the footsteps of their parents or grandparents but that's not what happened with you right you well, you you actually went your own way yes i am the white sheep of the family my grandfather and father and brother and daughter and several cousins are all attorneys so I'm the white sheep of the family. I'm the only one who, uh, who uh, actually does math for a living. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I come from an old Texas family. Uh, my family moved to Texas before the Republic of Texas was founded. We actually still have some of the land that was granted to the family for a performance during the uh, Revolutionary War of 1836. Um, I'm also, therefore, I'm told I'm legally Hispanic because we gave up our U.S. citizenship and swore fealty to the King of Spain. And as a result, I think that legally makes me Hispanic. It doesn't matter. No one in my family has ever spoken Spanish. Wow. But anyway, my father and grandfather were very entrepreneurial, but they were not mechanically driven. But I always was interested in electronics. And I just so happened to grow up at the right place and the right time to see the growth of the early computing movement in the 1970s. And I got in on that. And I was able to get in more or less on the ground floor. And that allowed me to, to uh, be an entrepreneur and be a nerd at the same time. Now, I know for many kids and adolescents and even young adults, Sometimes they feel pressure from their families to follow in their family's footsteps, yet they have a passion for something else. So when you look back on what um, enabled you to stick to your interest, even though other people were doing different things, were people very supportive of you from, from the beginning, or did they try to push you towards things that they were doing? I got a little bit of both push and pull. My parents were absolutely terrified at the idea of my not, of my taking a technical lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> they wanted me very much to get a degree in business. They ultimately dis, uh, insisted that I go to a university that was not at the time the right university for me to go to. As a result, I never ended up with a college degree. And it wasn't, um, was it not the right um, one because it wasn't what you were interested in? Was it, was it more in the business oriented type of uh, college? I, I went to the University of Texas at a time when it was, it was and still is a world-class institution. 
but the particular degree that I was seeking was at that time, not one that was good at the university. Today it is world class. But as a result, I ended up trying to cut across different departments to get the information that I needed. And I ended up not doing very well as a result, trying to cobble together an education. Um, <clears throat> I knew what I needed to know and they weren't interested in letting me learn it. They wanted me to follow their rules. The when, when, I'm sorry, and when you say what you wanted to know, that was regarding what you wanted to go into, not in terms of the business. Yes. You were following your passion. Yes, I was following my passion and I wanted a, a well-rounded education in the concepts of computation. Mm -hmm. uh, I was consulting as early as my sophomore year in college in the middle of the oil boom in the late 70s, to early 80s. Um, I actually had a client that was in Houston while I was living in Austin. And the client wanted me in Houston so badly, they called me up and told me that they have just chartered a 747. And that I was to meet it at the Austin airport and to fly into, uh, into Houston. My reply was, first of all, I'm fat, but I'm not that fat. I don't need a 747 all to myself. And secondly of all, I didn't think you could land a 747 at Austin's Municipal Airport, which is not the airport they have today. And it turned out they couldn't. So I never saw the plane. I don't know if they actually, they, they may have been completely making it up, but I doubt it. That was the era of the oil boom when they were doing completely crazy things in Houston. But um, I was caught between a, a university that, had, that wanted to teach me how to design uh, power plants and uh, stereo uh, radios. And uh, I wanted to learn how to design the meanest, nastiest, fastest, cheapest computers in the world. What got you interested in the computers? Do you remember? Like what, what, do you remember the moment where you were like, I, I'm interested in computers. I'm interested in, in inventing something or adding something to what's already out there. Well, I loved to tinker as a child, but my, my father, who was quite an entrepreneur himself, had introduced me to heavy equipment as a small child. The business that my father had that made the most money most of the time was a wholesale lumber company. But we also had ranches between, so there was bulldozers and, tr and trucks and forklifts and things. And we would, uh, he would take me as a child out of school and I would ride with him all over Southeast Texas and Southwest Louisiana on various adventures. And I climbed around equipment that it would absolutely terrify people today. And this was before the days of OSHA. These machines, well, they were man killers. And um, I fell in love with the various things. But the big thing I realized was that trucks needed some help. And so I came up with an idea for a way to improve the driving of trucks, but it required a design that could make decisions. It actually had to have a policy inside of it. And so from there, I got interested in logic design and from there, I got interested in computers. And then in the fall of 1975, my friend Lee Felsenstein wrote an article in Popular Mechanics magazine about how you could design a microcomputer. And from that point forward, I was hooked. Wow. And, you know, one of the things I know that you've talked about in terms of being an inventor, an inventor always learns. And it sounds like that a lot of the things that you learned both in all of the different settings, you know, you talk about all the things that you've done uh, when you were a young child in terms of being on the, in the trucks, on the farms, in different areas, that you learned a lot about a lot of things. And, you know, it really reflects in, not only in all of your inter in inventions and patents, but in your writing as well. So if somebody's out there and they're really interested in inventing something, what would you say is, would be most important for them to know? Well, the first is you don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to invent something today. Mm -hmm. The second thing is there's no such thing as information that isn't useful. I have never had a situation where I learned something that didn't turn around and become valuable to me within a relatively short period of time. 
Um, the third thing is that most good inventions are built upon tying two previous ideas together. And ideas like fashions tend to go in circles. If you know the history of a particular technology, you will find that probably tomorrow's technologies have a lot to do with the technologies that have been obsolete for a little while. Um, and that you will tie technologies together from one area to another. Well, cross-connecting things. So your best solutions are when you begin to think of things in the big picture and begin to connect them together. One of our problems in our society is that some people are born with strategic thinking and some people are born with tactical thinking. That our schools are designed for tactical th thinking only. You have the time to the end of the class or the homework that's due this day or tomorrow or this week or maybe the end of the semester. But you don't think long term, you don't think big picture, you don't think what am I trying to accomplish here? The kids are floating along in the school stream. I was born or, or first with strategic thinking. And as a result, I tend to look at the big picture. And then I find holes in the, in the fabric and figure out, oh, well, that needs to be filled. That helps me. But that's not the way all people work. So let's just go back to something to, to further define and clarify. You said strategic thinking versus tactical thinking, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's just uh, define it a little bit more, if you would. So tactical thinking is thinking more about learning something that's almost in isolation to itself, um, as opposed to looking at it in the bigger picture of things? Right. Uh, tactical thinking and tactical problem solving is where you're dealing with the information that's immediately in front of you and is the next hurdle. It's not the hurdle after this hill or after the next mountain. It's what you have to do to survive or get through whatever you need to get through in the next short period of time. Strategic thinking is when you sit back and say, how can I best solve this problem given that I'm going to have to go from this place to this place? Maybe I don't want to follow the straight route. Maybe it's a lot easier to go around the mountain and it'll take longer, but it'll be faster or it'll be, it'll take more steps, but it will be faster. Now, you mentioned that in the education system, you see this as an issue. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, I saw it with my daughter, and I've seen it with several of the kids that I've mentored. They tend to be strategic thinkers, yet the teachers really are not. I think the average person is not. There's nothing wrong with being a strategic thinker or a tactical thinker. I just think that there's an intentional, there's a potential mismatch. Strategic thinkers really need to understand where the information fits in the world. Tactical kids are just told, here's a, here's a chapter, read it and do the, the questions. Where a strategic kid needs to, needs to understand, you're going to be learning about the insides of a frog. And this is why you need to know this information because this information will generalize into uh, other amphibians. And you can also then see the differences with mammals and avians. You know, the, if they have the bigger picture, things work better. It's just a question of what size picture you have to have. You know, it's interesting. It reminds me of, of an adjunct professor at a community college. And we have a program there that's um, um, the learning communities. And what we do with learning communities, are you familiar with learning communities in the, in the uh, community college or in college realms? What, yes, I actually yeah. was an adjunct professor for a semester also. Right, okay, so with the learning communities, and so some of my classes are for learning communities and some aren't, and what I love about the learning communities, and for those of you that don't know what it is, it's where um, the, the students in, in this way, this is the way that um, we had it in, in our college, is that the students travel together. So there's a group of say 20, 25 students and they're going through all of their classes and the professors are also linked together so that we have a theme and the theme applies to all the different subjects. So I teach psychology. So in psychology, we might match it with 
um, with uh, reading and with writing and also with one of the sciences. And so it's, it's great because they can apply it to, um, and see how one concept can be applied to all of the different subjects. Is that similar to your concept? Because that's that what is, it reminds me of. That is the flip side to my concept. Okay. That, that they walk hand in hand. One is, a, one is a requirement and a method of solving problems, and the other is a method of getting information in and organized. And they're both crucially important, and they walk hand in hand together. Um, I, have, I, I have an odd and uh, perhaps maverick opinion that there's no such thing as a child with a learning disability. I believe that everyone learns different ways. Maybe there are 100,000 ways for people to learn. A given person may only be able to learn 30 or 40,000 of those ways. They bump into a teacher that teaches a subject in a way that they do not naturally possess a, a facility for, then they're going to show up as having a learning disability. But I have yet to find a concept that I couldn't teach to a kid just because I had to find the way to get the information between their ears. And you I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to take one of your science classes for sure. Like for absolutely. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more on that concept. I've explained quantum mechanics to an eight year old. Okay, now, so I'm we're gonna, gonna we're gonna have that. We're gonna do that on another show for sure. I, I will not tell you this person could design an, an H bomb. But when it was all said and done, the person actually could under could explain to you how relativity worked. Now, I think people are going to want to know where you're teaching. Are you currently teaching any place? Uh, no, it's all, I, I'm a partially retired technologist and I work, I'm on the board of directors of some startups and uh, I develop technologies for companies. So I, I help kids, the friends of kids. Um, and I've been doing that for years. So we're going to have to get you to do a few more lectures on for the mentor project and different topics. Cause I, think I will, that's what, I that will gladly do. I will gladly do that. Um, my, when my daughter was in school, uh, she would always drag me in and I have lectured at a lot of universities as a result. Uh, there's lots of silly things people don't know and it's, it's fun to, to learn about, like the fact that computers don't know how to subtract. Most people don't realize that. That's they fake it. They don't know how. That's fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I, I know that recently you actually have, I mean, you have 25 patents and I think you got a new one recently, and that was on the on solar energy. Yes. Do you want to, uh, talk about that, would you? I'm, I'm uh, certainly. Uh, I'm a founder of the company called Nova Solix, um, and uh, the the actual honest to gosh founder is a good friend of mine, Larry Cook. I'm on the board of directors, and Nova Solix has a breakthrough technology that completely obsolete solar power as you know it. Um, standard photo cells that you mount on the top of your house can only gather about 20% of the uh, power from electricity, uh, from light. That's because they're very picky as to what types of radiation they can absorb. Matter of fact, on a warm day with the sun shining bright, if you put your hand on a solar cell, it's hot because it absorbs a lot of the radiation as heat not electricity. Well, we look at the problem totally differently. Light is just radio waves at a very high frequency. It's like your AM radio, only just you could keep turning the knob for a couple more thousand turns to the right. Well, <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're making little radios, little radios that receive light. We're making a quadrillion of them per square meter. And as a result, we have theoretically the ability to gather four to five times as much energy per square foot as a regular photo cell or a solar cell. But also it allows us to build the cells out of very economical materials, aluminum, carbon, things like that. We're using carbon nanotubes and we're making little bitty simple radios. And the nice thing about that is that we're able to harness not only visible light, but also ultraviolet light, the stuff that gives you a sunburn, and infrared light, the stuff that's hot. And as a result, we're able to tap a larger pool of energy. We're able to convert it more efficiently and do so 
more economically. Matter of fact, our solar cells also fold up and roll up because they're very easy. Um, our goal is to make them so cheap that they're cheaper than regular roofing so wow. that people will just put them on their homes. Uh, if, you, if you cover a car like a Tesla with our production units, we expect that most people in the Southwest will never have to charge their cars because if you just park it in the parking lot and you drive fewer than 80 or 90 miles a day, that it will keep your car fully charged. So that's wonderful because this is multi-purpose. I mean, you're using this one uh, patent and technology for lots of different purposes. Now you're thinking, now you're seeing the strategic component to it. By picking, by picking a point of high leverage, you can have a big effect across multiple industries and you can change the world. The one thing that is unique about the attitudes of Silicon Valley and the reason why I came to Silicon Valley is because there's this view that yes, we can change the world. And I have changed the world in my little bitty way. Uh, and I know a lot of people who have changed the world in small and large ways, but it's a system that reinforces itself. I think that's such an important uh, belief system to have, regardless of what field you're in, because I think it really does apply to everyone's life in any field that one is in, in terms of everybody can change the world, that we all can contribute in some way, in our unique way. Because I know I hear from so many people that they feel like they can't do that. So I would love for you to underscore that message. Oh. It's very important. Um, when I grew up, I grew up 80 miles from the Johnson Space Center. And I grew up in the, in the 60s when going into space was the thing. I knew the names of all of the astronauts. I knew exactly all the, all the three letter and four letter acronyms for all of the equipment. And I knew all of the issues and I followed it, you know, the way most kids would follow baseball or football. Uh, I saw them change the world. And then when Silicon Valley really hit in the early 70s, I realized this is a place one can go to change the world. There are many places to go to change the world. There are many worlds to change. People that go to Hollywood to make different movies or, or things, they're changing that world. Um, people who go to Wall Street, they can change that world. There are many, many worlds to change. Uh, and they're all important. But so what, would, a, what, would you, what would your message be to a young person out there, or even a not so young person, who has some ideas, who's always wanted to try something, but they think, oh, no, I can't do that. Or no, you know, it's not going to make a difference anyway. Or it's been, maybe it's been done before. What would, you, what would you say to them? Well, the first thing I would tell them is, Yes, it's probably been done before, but probably not done right or not done well. You can do it better because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. That's the first and most important thing. If you do your homework, you can almost always improve anything. And our entire society is based upon the idea of, I can make it just a little better, a little cheaper, a little faster, a little safer, a little shinier. And that's what we do. You, if you are a little bit of a student of history, you will realize that in 1800, the average person had two shirts and two pair of shoes. And that's middle class for the United States, much better than it was in Europe. Uh, the quality of life that we've had in improvements in the last 200 years are absolutely shocking. And it's only getting better. I get tired of the news telling people bad news. The things are getting so much better and they're getting better at higher and higher speeds. We have momentary setbacks and things like that. But that's what you want the, a, a youngster to understand is that they're kind of riding and surfing along on a wave that's only headed towards good. And they can help push it forward. And it needs lots and lots of people. If you were to line up every basic research scientist in the world against the wall and shoot them, kill them right now. That's a little drastic. <laughs> okay. We would still have breakthrough products coming out of the R&D pipeline for the next 50 years. 
because we've got such a huge amount of technology and such a huge front of technology areas where we're tying things together from over here to over here that it will take decades just to just to harness what we have. Um, and by the way, I don't want to shoot anybody. I don't want to be put against the wall, but I wanted to make the point that really there's so many ways to contribute. You don't have to be a basic researcher. You don't have to, you don't have to discover DNA. You know, you can do lots of other things that'll contribute. And we know that sometimes the best inventions come by accident. It's the people that are working on one thing that really another thing is discovered, right? It's not the thing sometimes that you're looking for, but it's something that comes up by accident. The most important phrase you'll ever hear in a lab is, that's funny. <laughs> That is, I mean, but that's, uh, and, and, and how so? How so? When you say that's funny, is that because, oh, we didn't expect that? Well, one of, one of my inventor friends has a saying, he says, the equipment in the lab is not aware of your, of your theories. Oh, I love that. I love that. Say that again. The, in, the equipment in the lab is not aware of your theories. His that's name is Dave right. Wyland, and he's also the author of Wyland's Law. And Wyland's Law is anything that can be done for you automatically can be done to you automatically. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Well, and that's a two two edged sword, and it yeah. it's becoming more important in our society. Uh, he authored that about forty five years ago. But the important thing is, some inventions come from surprises. That's where you where you put two and two together and get seventeen, and it happens. But other inventions come from a recognition of a problem. Many, many inventions are actually quite easy to invent. The problem is figuring out what you need to invent. Um, say a little bit more about, yeah, say a little bit more about that, Bob, in terms okay. of what, what you need to invent. Penicillium, which, was, which is the bacteria from which we get penicillin, mm -hmm. was well understood in the early 1900s. It was understood and it was known to produce uh, as a byproduct, kind of uh, as a waste product, this material that killed other bacteria as a defensive mechanism. And it was a problem in medical labs because if you got it on your, on your beakers, it was hard to get rid of it and it would keep you from being able to grow things. And that's a problem. It took a long time for someone to realize that maybe just maybe that that waste product could be processed a little bit and put into a human without killing the human and it might instead kill the things you want to kill in the human well that was a big deal and so the actual invention was quite simple they knew how to grow the bacteria they knew how to what the bacteria did but someone had to realize that by putting it into a human body you might be able to come up with a way that it wouldn't kill the human and could actually solve problems. There's many examples of people uh, just realizing that you could put slot A into tab, or tab B into slot A or vice versa. Uh, there are lots of simple things. Most of my better inventions are obvious in hindsight. Matter of fact, that's one of the real problems we have with inventors is we tend not to give them any credit because you look at something and you go, well, that's obvious. Now, well, what would be an example of an invention that you uh, did that was looking back on it was obvious? Um, I was one of the inventors of the file server appliance, which is the primary mechanism for the internet to store information today. Can you talk uh, a little bit more about how that, how, how, what that exactly is? It used to be that when computer networks began to be popular in the 1980s, that if you wanted to store information, you either stored it on your current computer or you stored it via the network on another big computer. That meant that if you had a group of desktop computers, you were somewhere, you had a really big, expensive, nasty, hairy computer that you used to store your information. Well, the truth of the matter is you didn't need a big, carry machine to do that work. What you needed was a, a small machine that knew how 
to store the data. But people didn't think that way. People thought, I have to have a big computer for that. Well, you could spend $100,000 on a big computer when you needed to spend $5,000 on a small device. So some friends of mine and I invented the concept of the file server appliance, which was the same way as you have an appliance in your kitchen or your utility room. That is something that has a function that doesn't do anything but that function and does it economically and does it quietly. And we actually produced the, the first prototype. And matter of fact, we are the people that came up with the term appliance and it was stolen from us and we ended up litigating. But um, the term appliance is now on a term of art inside of the computer world, but it was actually invented by uh, uh, a friend of mine. Wow, very interesting how things are taken from one field to another and then just used and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and also just, not, yeah, and not getting credit for it, right? Because well, we hear names of people that invented something, but then we look closer, it was actually somebody else's contribution that really was at the base of it. There are a lot, remember that the stories are written by, uh, I won't say just the winners, I will say the stories are written by the person with the best PR. Um, Thomas Edison's light bulb was never the light bulb that the United States used. We always used the Zeeman light bulb, um, wh which is which is based on a metal filament, not a carbon, not a not a cloth or carbon filament. But Edison did have the strategic view to say, if you're going to have electricity, you have to have a generator, you have to have a distribution system, you have to have a billing system, and you have to have a switch, and you have to have a light bulb. Uh, nobody else had thought it through at that level. So give, the, give him his due, but don't get confused as to what he actually did. There are many examples of things like that where people almost have it. Uh, Nikola Tesla invented radio, but uh, Marconi got credit for it. But it turns out Marconi was using Tesla's equipment. Interesting. Now, I want to shift gears just a teeny bit because you are the co-founder of The Mentor Project. And I know that you do great mentoring just based on our conversation. I feel mentored right now on some of these areas and I look forward to learning a lot more. Who are your mentors? I had, I had a large number of them. My parents, first of all, my father was one of the smartest people I think ever existed. I know that he was used by one human engineering institute as perfect in over three quarters of their measurements. So I'm not making it up when I say wow. he was really, really off the scale sharp. What did he do? Like, what did he, in that realm, what did he do when you say that? My, my father, my father was a strange man. He was a mule smuggler. He was a, a professional mule smuggler. audio writer. He was a truck driver. He loved running, uh, he loved running uh, cattle and wild horses. Uh, and as a rancher, he also was a state senator and an attorney. And so he, he had many interests. He had many interests. Many and interests. if I could ask him a question, he would, he, he usually had an answer. And sometimes he'd go look it up, but I would ride around with him. I got to spend more time with my father than most kids. And we would, we would be driving places and I would just ask him questions nonstop. He also had friends who were very intelligent in different areas. And as a result, if, I, if he didn't know the answer, he would hand me off to a friend who was a university professor or uh, a doctorate in one thing or another. And as a result, I was mentored by many, many really wonderful people. I was also lucky in school to come across some really extraordinarily good teachers. And the parents of some of my friends also helped out. Uh, I've kind of been lucky at every turn to bump into people who were willing to teach me things. And I've been mentored even recently uh, by people who had things to teach me that were willing to set me down and answer my questions. Because I don't learn the way the average person learns. I need to ask questions and argue with people. I need to actually almost have a wrestling fight with you to get information out of you. Um, that's how I learn. And that can be tiresome to someone. 
So, you know, what's so important about what you're saying, and, and I know I, I stress this when I teach students, is to know how you learn, that it, there is not one way of learning, and that um, one of the important things is to know yourself in terms of, well, how do I learn and what do I need? And then to be able to maybe say to a mentor or to a teacher, you know, this is what I need. Can you help me in this way? So can you, talk, can you share a little bit about what you discovered about your own learning style? Yes. Uh, I learned, for example, there's a, a natural rate at which one can learn new material. And uh, some co in classes in college, they would go too slowly, at which point in time I would become bored. Right. Other classes would move too quickly, at which point in time, by the time November came around, I really understood the material from early October. And that was really not useful when the midterm came around or the, or the final exam came around. But if I took the class a second time, well, I get an A in it because I would had a long enough period of time for the information to sink into my brain. Um, I also realized early on that there is a difference between getting a passing grade and mastery. And this is one of the most important things that I was very fortunate to have beaten into my head. If a first grader is learning the alphabet, and if 70% is a passing grade, then why do they need to learn letters past Q? That's 70% of the alphabet. Why do you need to know verbs? You know nouns and adjectives. You don't need to know these other things, right? Well, wrong. You have to know 100% of it. There's a lot of things that you have to know 100% of. And you have to master it. And you have to master it completely forward and backwards. And you have to get it down right. There's lots of things in this world you can know 70% of it. It's pr probably not important to someone whether they get the date of the Battle of Hastings exactly right. But you have to understand where the Battle of Hastings sits in the world. And so one of the problems that I bumped into is a lot of people have gaps in their knowledge because they have 70% knowledge on things that are foundational. And then when they get farther in life, they don't have an easy way to go back and fill in. Uh, that caused me to want to master the basics. And I found that in many cases, a mastery of the basics was much more important than getting into the esoteric higher levels of stuff. Um, and that, would that be the basics in many different fields? Like not just in the field that you're interested in, but well, just really the basics of history, the basics of math, the basics of, you know, in, in terms of all the different subjects. Absolutely. For example, there's a, uh, one, uh, some of the patents that I have are based upon um, some obscure mathematics based on finite fields. Uh, I love it. Two plus two is equal to zero. It really works that way. Um, what, one plus two is equal to three. That works. But one minus two is equal to three. Anyway. It, it, Do you, want to, you want to explain that? <sighs> I can, but I can't in, the, in a finite period of time. The okay. very short version is that you're used to numbers that have an infinitely large number line. And those are called infinite, infinite field numbers. But there's a finite, there's another type of mathematics where you constrain the universe. And they're useful for certain particular uh, esoteric applications. In one particular case, uh, you can actually say, the only universe is integers from zero to 255. In my case, that's really useful because that's a value for eight bits in a computer. And that's a, a very common in, uh, unit of data. Well, then you have multiplication and division and all these other operations. But the neat thing is you can't get a fraction. So you can't divide three by two and get get two thirds um, or three halves or any other bizarre fraction, you have to get an integer. So <clears throat> the, the operations that you're used to do not necessarily give you the results that you expect. 
So, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna need a full lecture on this one. I think we're short, gonna. I think yeah. The short version is that if you are comfortable with the underlying operations of addition and subtraction and how to use them to solve problems, if you close your eyes and have faith in the mathematics, you will get the correct answer. But if you try to use your intuition through it, you can become very confused. But if you master the basic math that you learned in first, second, third, fourth, fifth grades, that's, that will see you through because you just simply close your eyes and say, I'm not going to look down. I'm not going to, I'm going to do this operation. I will get a number. I'm going to trust that number is correct. And I will go to the next step. It, it's, it, it can be a little mind blowing at times. Wow. That's great. So getting back to your learning style. So what did you, how did you figure out what you needed to do? Like you mentioned that um, if you took a class a second time, then it stayed long enough so that you would understand it. How does that show itself now? Like, how does it translate into your learning now? It, it means that I have a long list of things I'm trying to learn. And some things I spend five or six years trying to teach myself. I'm now mostly an autodidact. Um, and I will go buy eight or 10 books on a topic and read the first three chapters of all of them and fight back between each other until I work my way through a topic. And I think, I think that's so important to people because someone like you who is brilliant, who has all these accomplishments in really technical fields, from the outside, it looks like, oh, that just must come easy for you. And for people that really have to struggle to learn it, they may think that they're really just not intelligent, but it's not that. It's that, and it's refreshing to hear, and I know a lot of people will find this really helpful, and especially to kids who, who don't grasp. And, and for some people and some children, they find it difficult just to sit and to learn it. But what you're saying is, okay, get three books at a time, get four books, learn a little from each, and see what you need to do in order to process it for yourself to understand it. Exactly. Um, everyone has to fight their own battles. And what, one of the most important things that I have learned is that if I just keep, met, if I keep hitting my head against the wall, eventually the wall will give or my head will get bloody or both. But um, I have overcome what were for me huge barriers, which for other people were trivial things that they were able to learn just by listening to one lecture or reading one paragraph. Some things have taken me a long time to learn. Uh, other things just made such sense to me that, you know, why even read the book? The, it's so obvious from the first paragraph exactly what's going to be in the rest of the book. It's, I don't need to waste my time. Um, these both happen to lots of people. Um, but learning this way is, uh, again, I go back to the, there are 100,000 ways to learn and everyone has 30 or 40,000 of them. So there are some ways you can't learn. Um, one thing that helps me is that my wife puts up with me and she, while she does not program, she is uh, a brilliant woman, much smarter than I will ever be. And uh, she has helped me find bugs in code and in designs and things like that. Not because she knows how they operate, but because she makes me walk through them and say them out loud. And then she figures out and asks intelligent questions and almost always embarrasses me within the first 30 seconds. That's, that, that's great though. That's wonderful. Now, you know, the time has gone by so, so quickly. I just want to ask you a couple more things and then we're definitely going to have to continue these discussions. Um, but what you mentioned that there's lots of things that you want to learn about. So what's three things that you look forward to learning about right now? Uh, well, I'm trying to learn more about certain classes of circuitry that operate at exceedingly high frequencies like light. It turns out electromagnetic radiation, radio and light, are form a spectrum and the, depending on where you are on the spectrum, the world is a different place. And there's a lot of surprises there. And there are, we haven't really paid attention to the full spectrum continuously. We've kind of peeked in at different areas. Um, the idea that your microwave oven works at one frequency and weather radar works at six times that frequency. Um, 
but rather whether radar works at the uh, frequency it does is because it just so happens to be the frequency of the absorption spectrum of water. So they can essentially see clouds. Well, clouds don't reflect radar. Well, yes, they do if you pick the right radar. So there's lots of things like that to learn. Um, I've always been fascinated by uh, how we got to where we got. And I'm always digging into the history of the, of the Industrial Revolution and the next Industrial Revolution that we're on. And so I'm constantly learning about basic technologies that are going to bend us in the future. Um, the, for years, I've predicted that we're about to have a new John Wayne movie. And it may be a new Marilyn Monroe movie. Well, that was a laugh up until the last three or four years where the concept of deep fakes has become possible. The concept was, of, I'm sorry, repeat that. Deep fakes. And if you can, you can Google for that, you can find many of them on YouTube where they have digitally processed an image of someone who is not saying the words, but it sounds as if they're saying those words and it looks as if they're saying the words, but the person may be long dead. Um, Which is also very dangerous. Oh, it's exceedingly dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Uh, Mr. Degrapati at the MIT Media Lab wrote a book on the Media Lab back in the 1980s in which he said, within two years, you should not trust any signature or any photograph because they can always be fab fabricated. That was over 30 years ago, and it's certainly true today. Yeah. And by the way, that's one of the prices you pay. All technologies come with prices. And there's another thing I would tell every inventor, and this, this is a heartbreaking thing. Once you invent something, you lose all moral control over it. Mm, yeah. All inventions, there's no such thing as an intrinsically good invention or an intrinsically bad invention. There's only how it is used and you do not have control over that. Perhaps the greatest evil in our history was used by a chemical using a chemical called Zyklon B. But Zyklon B was actually a very valuable and useful chemical for killing off uh, mice and uh, insects and for cleaning out factories that had vermin in them. And then they used it to kill people. Don't Collater the collateral damage, right? There's always collateral damage on every great thing has something. Well, any invention can be used in an evil way. Yeah. And the person that invented it would probably not be pleased with how it was used. I've had inventions that were used in ways that I do not approve of. My first patent was on an imaging device, something you would call a tricorder. And the same technology is now what they use by TSA to look at you under your clothes. Now, I, that was actually a parallel invention. Uh, my actual research did not result in those products. It's the same technology. Uh, I have no moral control over the way that they use it. I personally think that what TSA does with people is hideous. And if people actually understood what was being done with their information, they'd be really, really upset. Um, oh. That's a discussion for another day. Another day. You know, Bob, we only have a few more moments, and I'm, I'm about to ask you this question, but I'm thinking, I've learned so much about you, and we, we just, it's just so interesting, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there something that you think that people would be surprised to learn about you? There are lots of people that are listening that know you well, and there are other people here today that are watching you for the first time. But what would, what would be something that people would be surprised to learn about you? That I'm really an extreme introvert. Um, I, I have not left my home since the middle of January, it's now late June, and I'm happy. My office has no windows. I have historically selected offices with no windows. Uh, as an executive in a large corporation, people get upset and say, don't you want a big picture window in a corner office? Uh, no, I want a room that doesn't have a reflection on my screen. Um, I, I really, act extroverted from time to time, but it's an act. 
It's an act. It's, so it's not that you're an ambivert. It's that you truly feel that you're an introvert. Okay. Well. My, my father, as a politician, uh, saw to it that I learned to behave this way. At the age of five, I was given public speaking lessons. And so I learned early on that it was a behavior that I was expected to do. But I get exhausted from that. I, I, I have to sometimes spend three or four days barely speaking to my wife, not because I don't like her, it's just that I've had too many people around me. Well, I hope today's experience wasn't too exhausting for you. I, this has been just, I mean, I could go on for hours. And um, You're you know, very we, kind and you're wonderful. Thank you. Um, you are unbelievable. And I, I'm going to arrange for you to do a few more lectures for the Mentor Project. And I know that you, we didn't even get to talk about what the mentor project means to you. So that we're going to start with that on our next conversation because I know well, that you're the co-founder. So, and, and I know that so many people are looking forward to your next in patents and adventures and, and inventions and books. And you just are offering so much and giving so much to the world, including the mentor project. So I just want to say thank you so much, Bob. It's, I just feel privileged and I'm so grateful uh, to have met you and to have this opportunity. Thank you very much for your taking the time and for being so nice to me. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> okay, and thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again on another episode of The Mentor Project. Be safe, take good care. And please, you can find Bob and his some of his lectures. And if you want to ask him a question, there may be some things that you want to know more about. Please uh, find us on The Mentor Project. It's mentorproject.org and there's a section there ask a mentor please feel free to ask him a mentor i know i'm going to be asking him some things and and send also your ideas for lectures on there as well so thank you again and uh, look forward to seeing you all next time thank you <laughs>